Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to find out how you can improve your email deliverability and stay out of the spam box and with that generate more than double of the revenue in your email marketing. With me on the show today, Nikita Vakrushev joins me. He is the founder and CEO of aspectagency.com. Nikita has spent the last seven years immersed in the digital marketing world after starting his own e-commerce brand and quickly pivoting into the agency model. He found his place in the e-commerce advertising space and he has worked with over 100 DTC brands so far. So let's welcome him to the show. Hi, Nikita. How are you today? Pleasure to be here, Klaus. As a fellow listener, it's a dream come true to actually be on the podcast and provide some value. Great to have you on the show. Let's talk about email deliverability. A lot of people might think that it's very scientific and very technical. And when we start throwing around keywords like SPF, DKMD, Mark, and whatever, people will lose us. But we want to make a very uh, simple overview of what that is important. And specifically with the changes that came in place a couple of weeks ago in February, um, it is more important than ever to have you're set up right that your emails get delivered to the inbox. Tell me a little bit about the background and what's going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Google and Yahoo mentioned or implemented a new, I guess, extra layer of security by having you set up a DKIM record, which is just another security protocol that your email service provider goes through to make sure that, you know, if your emails are being sent from Nike.com, that they're actually coming in from Nike.com and not, not some spam or some Nigerian prints, for example. So you want to make sure to have your DMARC set up correctly, which is a very simple and easy to do. Honestly, if you look up DMARC tutorials, probably my video will come up first. So you'd want to look, you'd want to have your DMARC set up and you'd want to have your DKIM set up. Now with DKIM, I know it all sounds complicated and I don't want to get super technical here, but all of these records do have a purpose. Now with DKIM, like I said, it's an extra layer of security. And for most parts, like if you're using Klaviyo, Sendlane, uh, Constant Contact, any other ESP, a lot of them have a dedicated sending domain that you can create. And all of that is automatically uh, connected with that sort of DKIM. So it's a very simple process. A lot of people overcomplicate setting up deliverability, but it's honestly just copying and pasting a few things and making sure that everything's verified. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a technical aspect that still doesn't yeah. help you to stay out of the spam box. There's yes. many, many, many more things involved. Let's talk a little bit about that. What should you do? What shouldn't you do um, to make sure that your emails get delivered? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, it's one part of a two part or sometimes even a three part aspect of deliverability. Um, you want to make sure your technicals are set up. When it comes to the content side of things, a lot of brands are using image only emails. You know, it's beautiful. It's great. You can just set them up in Canva, set them up in Photoshop or Figma, copy and, and paste those screenshots into your email and boom, you got a beautiful email. Now, the problem with that is a lot of these brands that I audit, they have these image only emails, which look good, but they don't have any structure behind them. There's no alt text, which describes what the images are. And there's no text in general. Gmail, Yahoo, Apple, Outlook, all of them are scraping your emails before they even get it to the customer's inbox. And when they scrape them, they look for other content. And that's how they determine whether an email is spam or whether an email should be delivered in your inbox or uh, your primary box, your promotions box, whatever it is. They scrape everything that's within that email. Now, if you don't include any details, all they get is just URL to the image that the image is being hosted on. So your email looks very, very empty. So there, when you include alt text or include more descriptions or more text or like body text within the emails, that's when you start to... I guess, avoid the spam box in a sense, because you're giving Google more context on what the email is about. You know, they can't scrape those images. They can only see, okay, these image URLs are being there. And if you give them more context, they're like, okay, cool. This is about a sale or this is about a product launch. This is not harmful to the customer. Uh, so that's where we'd want to implement more text. Additionally, you'd want to minimize the URLs that you're sending. So one thing that we started implementing is we started to reduce the amount of social links that we include in our emails. So maybe just Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, just the main one uh, within the client emails and try to reduce any other unnecessary links within the emails. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. And I think from the usability or from a usability perspective, uh, it helps to have alternative text. Obviously, there's people who are visually impaired or whatever, and they might mm -hmm. not receive the email as you see it when you're sending it out. Now, 
talking about spam boxes and one question that comes off often is like how often should i send my emails obviously as a marketer you want to send as many emails as possible uh, but i see people also sending not enough emails what's what's your recommendation i would say you can send out as many as you can but try to keep it segmented uh, we try not to send out an email to someone that opened an email within 24 hours again so let's say if i sent you an email this morning i'm not going to send you another email later in the afternoon or in the evening because you're already you've already gotten hit with that email so we try to segment out the people that have it open so if you're constantly sending try to segment out people that have already opened uh, so that way you're not double dipping ideally we try to send out anywhere between two to three emails per week that we've seen that be a, a pretty good measure of success we try to avoid the weekends we mainly send during the weekdays during uh During times where it's, I guess, like the most common sense, people that check their emails in the morning, maybe sometimes at 7 a.m. or during lunchtime between 11 and 1 p.m. or 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. or after work, anytime after 5 or 6 p.m., but not, not before, I guess, 9 p.m. So the sending frequency purely depends on your strategy, but try to send out two to three a week. And if you are sending every day, just segment those users out so you're not double dipping. Mm -hmm. I want to go into segmenting in a minute, but I want to mm -hmm. just go back into deliverability. Um, one of the KPIs that we always had was the opening rate. That does yeah. not really work anymore. I still have people saying I have 70% opening rate, uh, which is misleading. Tell me a little bit about why opening rate as a KPI is not working. Yeah, a lot of that has to do with Apple privacy opens. So when Apple implemented iOS 14 and then 15 and 16, it started to exclude or not show uh, that people are opening or they're over-reporting that people are opening your email. So it's less of a KPI to use. Uh, we still use it for deliverability markers. Like for example, we had a client a couple of months ago when we switched them over to the new DMARC record uh, or the new DMARC requirements, their deliverability absolutely tanked. They went from 40 to 50% open rates to 10 to 12. Now, obviously, you know, you don't have to look into open rates, but you can see that, okay, they're getting a 10 to 12 open rate and their average email order value went from 500 to 50. Something's wrong there. Um, so if you want to dive deeper, I can go through like how we were able to fix that as well. Sure, absolutely, yeah, would be interesting. Yeah. So one of the things that we did when it came to that specific brand is we actually had to double check the actual, the records that we set up. So it turns out their email sending domain was completely different than their actual domain. So that was one of the mistakes that we made. So. It's such a simple mistake, but it was like one letter off. So it looks exactly the same from a distance, but we just didn't clarify that. That was a mistake on our part. So we were able to uh, figure that issue. We we rectified it by resetting everything up under the new domain. And we also installed Google Postmaster. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's a email tracking tool within Google that shows you your IP reputation, domain reputation, spam compliance. Um, and it's essentially like the canary in the coal mine for your email deliverability. So once we set it up, we saw that our email deliverability and our domain reputation was at like the lowest point possible. So we had to quickly pivot and start to re-engage our audiences specifically with Gmail. Uh, we started segmenting out the most recent engaged Gmail users, started building trust back up with Gmail. Slowly over time, we increased that pool of Gmail users from, you know, 500 to 1,000 to 1,500 to 5,000, 10,000. And then eventually we were able to work our way back up to the, the, uh, the overall list. And as we were doing that, our open rates actually skyrocketed from that 12% to 80%. And as we expanded our audience, they stayed between 70 to 80%. And now they're at around 60 to 70% with the entire audience that we send out to. So a lot of it goes down to segmenting your users properly and segmenting based off of the most recently engaged people. Uh, otherwise, if you're sending out to a pool of, let's say a thousand people, 200 of 250 or 200 of those people are, you know, people that haven't opened your email in over, let's say three months, those are going to be muddying the pool to the people that might be interested in and are still engaging, but that email might end up in spam or might end up in promotions because of that 200 people. So once we clear those people out, that aren't engaging, that's when we start to see better deliverability and better open rates and click-through rates and revenue, of course. I think it's a very important um, message that you give there is clean up your list. A lot of yes. people just, marketers are too afraid to do that because the numbers will go down. And 
with some marketers, the numbers of your email subscribers will down go down massively. And obviously no one wants to see that, but it hurts your deliverability. It, it hurts your business at the end of the day. Now, email marketing is, in my opinion, still one of the strongest marketing channels you can have. It's owned marketing, you own the list, and um, you can reach the customers with the right segmentation in the best possible way. Now, tell me what kind of approach do you have when it goes into e-commerce D2C brands to build up a proper e um, e email strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of the times it comes down from the pop-up that you see uh, on displayed on e-commerce. So once you go on the, the website, pop-up comes up, do you want a discount? We try to gamify it a little bit. So maybe including an extra step or two, asking more questions about maybe some of the habits they might have. So for a skincare brand, it's like, when do you do your skincare routine? It's like morning, afternoon, evening, getting more data, but also that causes higher engagement leading to higher opt-in rates. So we use the pop-up. Uh, we've also created Facebook funnels before. So if we're having a big launch or if we're having a VIP sale that's upcoming, uh, we try to get as many leads as possible from retargeting on Facebook. So we create a custom landing page or the client creates a custom landing page. We create the form and we drive a lot of traffic there. So that builds up a lot of hype and builds up the email list. Um, the other thing that we've done is forwardability. So when we do giveaways, we ask people to forward the email to add extra entries. And when people reply to that forwarded email, they get added onto our list. We obviously want to make sure that uh, they've opted in. So we do set up double opt-in for those users. But those are the top three ways that we've grown some of our customers' email lists. Mm -hmm. That's definitely an underrated strategy that you have there. Do you also use SMS text messages in with this strategy or how do you facilitate SMS at all? Yeah, so SMS does get tacked onto that pop-up like I mentioned before, uh, but we've also ran just view-only advertising where you, know, you have the offer, but it's like text this number, this keyword in order to get this offer. And then they, as soon as they text that, It makes, we make sure that they want to opt in. Once they opt in, we send them that offer and the link to get that product. So we've ran that before, and that has been a very cheap way to get SMS opt-ins, especially if you have like a, a retargeting pool, um, because those people are already familiar with your brand. It's not like you're going out to cold people and you know shoving an offer down their face. So that is a another good way that we've gotten SMS numbers. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one example before on how you could increase the the results of an email marketing campaign. Can you give me some examples of other brands that you worked with on what the difference that it makes to get email marketing right? Yeah, great question. So we've worked with more than a two or three dozen e-commerce brands over the last year. And a lot of the times, the thing that they liked is just proper email structure. They would have the call to action all the way at the bottom. They wouldn't have a timer on. Uh, the subject lines were stale and it wasn't like captivating. I would say one of our bigger case studies has been like Little Big Playroom. Uh, they're a children's toy brand and they have ball pits that are very, they're, they're premium ball pits, but at the same time, it's, it's a high ticket product and they couldn't crack email for years. Um, as soon as we came in, we, we implemented a new strategy for the welcome series, the abandoned cart series, post-purchase, cross-selling, et cetera. And we were able to get the revenue from, On average, I think it was like maybe nine or 10K per month to 20 to 30K per month uh, within the first month or so. But that's purely because we restructured their welcome flow. Uh, we ran brand new offers. So we were getting new people opted in uh, on a percentage basis that went from 1% to like 5% or 10%. Um, and I would say just restructuring the emails to be more conversion focused. So having that call to action above the fold, imp implementing urgency, scarcity, and timers into the email so people are actually... Um, I would, I guess they're rushing to buy the product rather than like, oh, maybe I'll buy it later, that sort of thing. So just implementing those basics from even like landing page basics into an email helped tremendously with that brand. Mm -hmm. When it comes to ESPs and um, to email tools, do you have a preferred setup, a preferred tools or apps that you use for the email marketing? Yeah, I would say the main two that we're utilizing right now is Klaviyo and Sunlane. Um, Sunlane has been a big partner for with us for the last couple of months, and we've been slowly getting more clients wrapped up on on that platform. Purely just a cost standpoint, it has similar, um, what do you call it? It has similar features to Klaviyo, but the price point is significantly better, especially now where you know there's economic uncertainty, and you know Klaviyo bills are getting higher and higher because they're a public company. 
Um, a lot of brands are switching from Klaviyo to Sendlane, which has, you know, been great because we've trained up on it. But at the same time, Klaviyo is still like, I guess, the master in e-commerce, D2C, uh, email marketing. So those are the main two that we use. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the economic situation. Do you see any kind of trends that are happening right now when it comes to DTC brands? Are they switching more to email or what's what's happening in the landscape right now? Yeah, I think a lot more brands are taking email and SMS more seriously because like you mentioned, it's an owned media. Once you have that email, you can utilize that email and, and market to them. And when you do send out these emails, they're relatively inexpensive compared to ad costs, you know. Your Facebook ad cost could be 30, 40, 50K per month, whereas your Klaviyo bill is like 2,000 per month. And the only thing that you're paying for is probably the designs. So it's relatively cheap and inexpensive to get a four to five times ROAS, or not even ROAS, but just like a return on investment through email instead of Facebook ads and, and TikTok ads. Uh, now on the inverse, just market trends overall, we did see a big decline in Q1 this year, a bigger decline than we did see last year. So my theory is a lot of people just overstretch their budget to get that, those Christmas gifts and those holiday gifts right. to the point where in Q1, especially in January, it was a very slow month for some of our clients because there was just not enough demand for those products because they spent all their money during the holidays. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting aspect. Never thought about that. When it comes to artificial intelligence, to AI, that's all over the MarTech space right now. Yeah. Uh, everyone has a app. Everything is coming up. I'm not sure if everything is really AI or just a marketing term um, labeled on a existing product. But when it comes to email marketing, um, are there certain areas where you see AI is really helping the marketer with their work? I would say it's a mix of two different... Um, we've used it... We Well, internally, we've used it in two different scenarios. Um, number one, we've used it to do customer analysis. So this has been a big push for us because we used to manually go through reviews, manually go through uh, product descriptions, that sort of thing. And now it's a lot easier because we can just copy paste, you know, a, a, an Excel sheet of all positive, all negative reviews and get a common denominator of like, can you, even with like ChatGPT, you upload the spreadsheet and say, can you give me five common traits of positivity that you got from these reviews? And now we have five different angles that we can create for the email side. Um, and then it's like five negative, can you, can you give us five negatives? And then we can come to the client like, hey, we've noticed this negative sentiment across the products that we think once improved, we can utilize that as a selling point. So we've seen that happen a lot uh, within the business where we've utilized AI to uh, not only improve our copywriting, but also improve the, the email angles that we're using for our clients that have worked tremendously because we're hitting them right in those pain points or right in the, the main selling points that they're looking for. Uh, the second use case we've used is utilizing background imagery. So sometimes, you know, waves or whether it's like lightning bolt or any specific pattern for a client that is just in the background and isn't the product image. We've used that a lot to to help set the tone for a specific email. Maybe it's a gradient. Uh, instead of paying for a stock image license, we pay for mid-journey. And we've been, we've been able to create some great backgrounds for some of our client emails as well. Good point um, to have a, a image that it's not only the product image just left yeah. in with a white background, but really make it relatable to the text or the topic that you're sending in out. Great tip there. Now you have worked with more than a hundred DTC brands. Who's your perfect customer? Are there any specific niches or verticals that you work more with? I don't specifically look at niche because we you know, when we worked with D2C brands, a lot of them are in the same cash conversion cycle. The only difference sometimes is they're a big one-time product or they're a small one-time product or they're a small recurring subscription. So I do prefer working with a subscription-based model businesses because it's a lot easier and you get a higher LTV from the customer once they're on a subscription-based. Um, so when we do capture a customer, there's way more value added there. But I would say the big thing that I look for isn't even in the specific brands, but more so the business owners, like business owners that are looking to grow and are looking to improve every aspect of their business to make sure that it's an absolute firehouse um, in a good way, of course, like we want to make, we want to work with people that grow. We're a team of growers and we're a team of that is, that is always pushing the boundaries and pitching new ideas to our clients. And we want to make sure that that's translated on the other side. We've had naysayers that we worked with before and it's just tough to get new ideas or 
new new ways to market with them because they're just going to be like, no, we're going to stick to what we've done before. And it's like, we're evolving. Good point. Yeah, I like to work with people that are on the same page like I am. It makes it just so much easier to to see results. Walk me through the typical onboarding process for a new client. What steps are involved? How long does it usually take to get up and running? Yes, that's a that's a great question. And this has been like a pain point that I've went through personally where the onboarding for maybe other vendors that I've used, it has taken me three or four weeks sometimes. And I hate that. I hate taking, like I, I, I signed up. I want to start utilizing the product. So our onboarding process is actually under five business days, if anything, if sometimes less than that, depending on how fast the customer uh, or the client can get us the the assets that we need. So it's pretty straightforward after like an audit process and after we've, we've agreed to the terms that we're going to be working on, we just invite them to the Slack, provide them video training hosted by yours truly, where I go through and walk them through the entire system, how we work together, Slack, any account invites that we might need, asset gathering, and once we get all that information, we have an onboarding call for about 45 minutes to an hour, make sure that we have everything. And then we're off to the races creating emails. And we typically have the first email ready for a review for them within 10 business days. Okay, that's very straightforward. I, when I'm, I'm with you. Um, you want to get up and running as quick as possible. And obviously, as a client, you want to see results as quick as possible. And that, that sounds great. How does your pricing structure work? Yeah, so we're actually a flat rate uh, pricing structure. We depend on, or it depends on the amount of emails that they're doing. So we have a base uh, a base service that we do include, like segmenting, uh, A-B testing, pop-up optimization and creation, um, reporting. All of those things are within the basics, but the price differentiates depending on how many emails they need created. And that comes down to the strategy. So for some clients where they come in and they're like, hey, we need our flow strategy completely redone. So then it's like, okay, we're going to be doing 20 emails the first month, and then we're going to be doing five to seven the following month to just handle the campaigns. Um, or we sometimes spread out the flow strategy over the first three months um, if they want to split that cost up. So it depends on the client, but um, yeah, it, it also depends on the amount of emails that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, our coffee break, break comes to an end today. Is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet? Um I mean, I would say just keep an eye on your deliverability, install Google Postmasters. If that's the only thing you learn, just install that and watch your deliverability and watch your domain reputation. Uh, make sure that you have your segmentation set up. And I think those are the main points that I'd want to highlight. And I guess if you want to audit, uh, we also do provide audits for your email marketing accounts. So it's free. Just submit your info and we'll get back to you within one to two days with things that you can improve on your email side. Okay. No, I think that's a great offer because sometimes you just don't know how your deliverability actually looks like. Um, you think everything is in the green and it might be a complete nightmare and you're not aware of it. Where can people find out more about you guys? Yeah, it's aspectagency.com, A-S-P-E-K-T agency.com. Um, and if you want to learn more about what we do, we actually publish YouTube videos on the weekly. Just look up my name and you'll find out a bunch of email marketing tips that you've probably never heard of. <laughs> Okay, I will definitely check it out. Nikita, thanks so much. I will put the links in the show notes here, just one click away for our listeners. And I hope a lot of people will get in touch with you to figure out if their email delivery actually works or not. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Klaus. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision. But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks 
that have been holding you back. And this way you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.